So I want to welcome you all. Uh, I hope you've had a really good week at Angle Brackets and Dev Intersections. Thank you for coming to our session. This is a session that Shane and I here, I want to kind of give an overview of kind of why this came about. A lot of people build applications, but they don't think about all the pieces that go into designing it. So we were building an application recently, and we were trying to figure out how do we get the data? Where do we get this data from? And we always just kind of you know, flippantly say, we're just going to go get data from some server somewhere, right? Just live somewhere, right, Shane? Yeah, there's APIs out there, weather data. There's all kinds of data. We just go out and grab it. Somebody else is taking the responsibility of building that back end for us. Why do I have to worry about it? I'll just go get it. Let somebody else deal with it. Usually I point yep. at Shane. Shane, you go build it. And he points at me and tells me to go build it. So yeah. <laughs> uh, we went through this motion and started thinking about, wouldn't it be nice if when you're building front-end applications with React, Angular, other technologies, you could find an easier way to build back-end applications that go along with them, or even mobile applications with APIs. So thus, this was the beginning of talking about building APIs, in this case for Angular, with Azure Functions, solving data problems. My name's John Papa. I'm a cloud developer advocate with Microsoft. This is my buddy Shane. Yep, Shane Boyer. I'm also a cloud developer on the Azure team, uh, working with um, all the great products we have in Azure. Cool. So kind of starting things off, Shane and I kind of have this uh, great affection for both Angular and Azure Functions. And I think you'll see why by the end of this talk. So today, we're going to talk about a couple things. We're going to start off thinking about how do we look at data in our applications. When we need to get data on the screen, what kind of data shapes do we have? have? Where do we get the data from? What are our options? How do we design an app to get that data? And then where do we get it from? And then we'll move into how can we cache the data if we want to cache some of that data on the client. There's several different ways to do it. Yeah, we, have, um, we can design an API backend, obviously, and use varying technologies. Well, I think uh, at this conference, we've seen uh, ASP.NET, ASP.NET Core. Um, there's node options. There's you know, many different technologies we can use. Um, and uh, there's a lot of ceremony in order to you know, wire those backends up to your front end. If it's Angular, React, and you want to hit that, front end, that back end, um, there's a lot of you know, the work to do to build a back end. I think sometimes we spend more time building that back end than we do with the front end. Um, there's testing implications. Or there's a lot of work to do to get that back end. So Shane, I have a question to ask you, and I think a lot of us can ask this for ourselves. When you're building a client application, and then you have to think about the back end API that you're building, isn't it frequent, would you say, or would you say infrequent? I mean, how would you describe the times that you actually need a back end that does more than just give me my data or save my data? <laughs> um, I would say it's pretty frequent. <laughs> pretty frequent. So yeah, when you're designing frequent. it then, does it matter if you're using ASP.NET, Node, Java, Ruby? It, it doesn't matter the technology. It, it's, there's, uh, regardless of the technology, we've got to consider a lot of things when, when we're touching the back end databases. And then you've got database applications as well. I mean, do I want to use Postgres? Do I want to use Mongo or SQL Server? Exactly. Cosmos, you know, you know, we've got a lot of choices to make. And when you're doing simple CRUD type applications or you're just trying to connect your back end, your existing back end, which might already do a lot of business logic, with a front end. We've had applications where we've written together where we access an already existing massive back end API system where we need to connect it with a front end. We just need something to connect those two, something with HTTP over APIs. Uh, and this is where this problem came into our heads of wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to think about designing a web API with ASP.NET or designing a Node Express server with all the right middleware and setup that we need. And kind of the point of this session is apps need APIs, in this case, Angular apps. And Azure Functions are a really easy way to get there, right? Yeah. Um, when you're building the Azure Functions, we can go into the portal. We can just write code and be all set. And uh, if we need to connect to an existing backend, Azure Functions gives us that ability to connect to uh, existing APIs through Logic Apps through uh, the databases that exist on Azure. If you have an existing API that you've built and you're hosting in Azure, we can also touch those. Blob storage, uh, there's a lot of uh, other existing uh, Azure products that we can touch uh, and connect to those Azure functions. Yeah, and I think you'll see when we're done with this, we'll show up the problem, we'll walk through some of the code and how you get data into an app, and then we'll kind of walk through why we feel, and we, we think you'll all feel as well, that using Azure Functions in this case, which is a serverless technology, we'll kind of talk about what that term means, is a really great solution for these kind of problems. 
So to start off, let's take a look at some of the issues that we have when we want to get data into an app. First, getting data into an app, we have to make sure that we have a way to get to the information. And the most simple way to get to data is to explicitly configure the data inside of a component or service. That also means hard code it, right? So we can hard code our data inside of a component or service in our Angular application and put it up on the screen. That's the first step we usually do when we're mocking things out or kind of designing. And then we go to the next step. What's that, Shane? Uh, we've got a way to, we need a way to connect to that data. Uh, we're going to use HTTP. We're going to make that get call and get that data from a JSON file. Um, typically, we would not use a JSON file. Uh, we want to actually hit some active data in a database. But sometimes just to start, when we're testing our app, we might put just a, a flat file on the, on the hard drive and, and connect to that to return that JSON data. Yeah, and the big jump here is the first step allows us to get moving quickly with the UI, but it's synchronous. And then the second step is now we're using HTTP against a JSON file. That forces us to use HTTP or the Fetch API, which then makes it asynchronous. So now we're getting asynchronous, which is a little more real world, right? We're, we're putting data into an app using real world. And then when it eventually, it becomes time. And say, now, now's the time I want to hit a real API. I can go build a node server with Express and logging, and security, and cores, and body parsing, and headers, and everything else that goes with it, and get the middleware in the right order, and design all that, when that really wasn't my intention. I just wanted to get data. Or I can go do the same thing with ASP.NET with all the middleware that it comes with and design what we need to do. But wouldn't it be nice if we could just go say, I need to get that same data I had in a JSON file, but I want to hit a certain database or a file, but have it be up in the cloud. Let's take advantage of the cloud to solve this problem. And the next step is once we get our data, wouldn't it be nice if when we go get our data on screens, we're not actually hitting the server for data that we could cache? For example, let's say we had a list on our screen that showed a list of all the states of the United States. Shane, would you like to cache that? No, I want to hit the database every time. You want to hit the database every time? Every single time. This um, is called job security. He, he goes in and does <laughs> that. And then he comes in the next day and goes, let me tweak that for you. Those states might actually change every time I hit the database. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they could change. And I might need to scale. Right. You could. Uh, some data we want to cache, some we don't. Right? Maybe uh, inventory we don't want to cache because it, it's very volatile. A uh, list of states we might want to cache. So we have to pick and choose. But when it does come time to cache, what's the biggest problem with caching, Shane, when we hang on to data? <sighs> We don't know how long to hang on to it for. How, yeah, when's it expire? We, when's it get expire? How long do we hang on to it? How do we know when to go get it again? Um, has it changed? Uh, all of those little flags we have to worry about, uh, e-tags, and uh, all the fun things that come with caching. Yeah, it becomes a problem. And sometimes you want your cache to be forever. Sometimes you don't want to cache at all. Those are the two extremes. Sometimes you want to cache for a certain amount of time. Sometimes you want to cache and have it automatically refresh. In the background, sometimes you want to cache and only get the data on demand. Lots of different options. So we'll look at a couple of ways we can solve these problems. Now, that's enough talking about it. Let's kind of do a demo and show an application that solves, or at least addresses, some of these issues. And this solution is up on GitHub. I probably should open the GitHub so we can actually see the URL for that one. I think we called this One with Angular. Is that right, Shane? Yeah, One with Angular. I can't imagine where we got that name from. Yeah, we happen to be big fans of a particular theme. So One with Angular is where you could find this code uh, that we're going to see today. You can check that out at github.com slash johnpapa, One with Angular. Once you get that code, let's take a look at what the application does. And I'll kind of make the data over here go away for a minute, or the dev toolbar. And we'll zoom in. And we refresh it again to kind of get an idea what it's doing. What we have here is we have a list of characters. We have a list of planets. Uh, characters are on planets. And characters also have allegiances. Some are Jedi. Some are Sith. Some are rebels. Um, some are bounty hunters. And some just haven't chosen what their vocation is going to be. So all of these are showing up in different places. And we have different needs for the data to be in different screens. So we have to merge data. Now, wouldn't it be nice, since this graph here shows planets based on how many people are in each one, and this one is the allegiances and how many people have different allegiances as well. So wouldn't it be nice if we could not, say, go get the data twice? Let's take a look at what's happening over here. If we zoom in on our network tab, 
And down here, what you're seeing is a couple things. First, we have cores going on, cross-origin uh, request sharing, right? Yep. So with cores, we have to go off, send off, a, what kind of a call is it? It's just a straight XHR call, HTTP call that we're making out to our Azure function. Yep, we just make an XHR call out to there. And before it gets there, we have to make a options call. And that options call is basically uh, doing that cores for us to see, hey, do you have permission to get out there? So that's why you see it twice. And w then once we do that, we're calling for people, planet, and allegiances. And we can see the response over here for our data in JSON format. This is hitting our Azure functions. Well, you may notice I kind of glossed over a red guy at the top up here. This people got called twice. What's happening here is on the first page, I have two different graphs. Both of them need people data. Now, I could have just said, go get the people data once and then share it. But I wanted to make a point here. Both graphs are created separately. And they both go get their own data separately. They know nothing about each other. So they can be pulled out and put anywhere in the app. So because they don't know about each other, I wanted them both to go get their own data on their own. And they both need people, so they both go get people. Now, we're using a technology called Reactive Extensions for JavaScript. And by using Reactive Extensions, what I can do is I can go make those two different calls, and it's smart enough to see, hey, you just asked for the same data twice in two different places. I'm going to cancel the one request before it comes back. And that's pretty neat. You think about that. Because how often do you have apps where you have to write isolated code, and you want to make sure that you're not calling the same thing twice? So it's being smart here and saying, you know what? I'm not going to bother. It's canceling what comes across over here. So that's what happened here. Now let's clear this out. If I go from there to characters, on the characters, it's going off into my cores request for pre-flight, and then it gets my people. Now let's go to planets. I got my planets. Now let's go back to characters and to the dashboard. Notice the only thing I got when I keep going back and forth was allegiances. What's happening there is the app was smart enough to know you'd already gotten characters and planets. I cached them. I'm caching for 30 seconds. Allegiances was cached earlier, but while I was talking, it expired. So when I went back to the dashboard, it said, ooh, your allegiances have expired. Let me go get those again. So I'm doing a timed cache in this case on demand, saying, don't get the data until I need it. And it's all hitting an Azure function. So let's take a look at the client to kind of see how this is designed. And we'll work from front to back. Here's an Angular app. This is the thing that's in that code. And uh, Shan, Shane, I called you Shan. That's your new name. Shan. <laughs> Shan. For the rest of the show, you're Shan. I'm one of the characters. There you go. You can call me Jim if you want. Okay. <laughs> so when we look at data in, inside an Angular application, we know we don't want to hard code inside of the component. But how do we make sure that we can reuse data calls in an application of any kind? Uh, we're going to basically abstract that into a service. Exactly. So here, we're going to have a service which I aptly named data service. It's crazy. Right? I'm really creative, aren't I? Crazy. <laughs> so in my data service, I have things like get planets, get allegiances. Get planets, notice the first thing it's doing is it's calling something called the allegiance cacher, or sorry, the planets cacher. The planets cacher, I'm telling it to update itself, and I'm sending it a force flag. The force flag is not like use the force. It's force it to <laughs> update or just see if it's in cache and let it expire. So you can tell it, you know, I want to make you go get new data because I don't like the data I've got already. And then once it does that, I'm returning back this cache object. And that cache object is returning an observable, an observable of the planet's array. And that's important because we're not bringing back the data we're saying, we want to watch this data, and when it comes in, you're going to let us know. So this observable is helping us. So then, who calls a data service in an Angular app, Shane? Uh, that would be our component. We'll go to the planets list. You are right, sir. It's like you've seen this before. Uh, just once or twice. Yes. <laughs> so in our app here, in line 34, we're calling the data service get planets. And he's listening to that su subscription. So the get planets is our observable. And then we subscribe to it and pull the planets out. So notice the component has no idea if I'm getting cached data or not, exactly as it should be. The component shouldn't have to make decisions. The component's job is to put the data on the screen. It doesn't know if we're hitting JSON. It doesn't know if we're hitting Azure Functions. 
It doesn't know where it's coming from. It just knows it's going to ask for data, and eventually the observable will observe the data, and then when we subscribe to it, it'll give it to us, whether it came from cache or over XHR on the web. And if we go back into that service, notice this one here really doesn't know if we're caching or not either. It happens to be calling an object called the cacher, but it's not making the decision of is it in the cache or not. It's all hidden behind the scenes in this caching object, which again, you can grab up off the web. It's some simple RxJS logic we'll take a look at. So Shane, writing caching logic, is that easy? Uh, no. no, as we have found out over the last many weeks. Yes, it's, been, it's kind of painful to put together, but once you get the data right, it's actually kind of good. So let's take a look at the Allegiance cacher. They're all type cacher. And you'll notice I'm defining these as a cacher object. And then you tell it, using generics, what kind of data am I caching? It's a string array. It's a planet array. The allegiances are just strings. It's a character array. So then I can go into the cacher object itself, and we can see kind of what it's doing. Here, we have a cache object that's pulling out an observable. And what it does, it's going to update under certain conditions. So we scroll down to some of these methods. We really only have a couple, like update when what. So let's go into this function here called create on demand cache. This is the guy who does all the work. And everything can pretty much be summed up in the parameters. We pass in the source, the observable we're going to be looking at. That's got the data, basically, the, the looking at the data part. Then we tell, when do we want to update? That helps, helps us decide, is it on demand? Is it expiring? How is this going to work? We have a notifier, which just sends off messages as it's looking, like I'm fetching, I'm done fetching, I'm using cache. And then there's an expiration period, which is optional. In my case, it did 30 seconds. And this is really important. What if it's the first time you hit the app, but you want the users to be able to do something? Maybe you've already got old data, and while it's getting the new data, you want to show the user the old data so they're not just waiting around. Have you ever like cached data in like local storage on the web? We could put it up in local storage. We put it there. We go get new data. If we wipe the data on the screen and make, make the user wait, it could be a second or two or three before they can use the app. Why not load the data on local storage, make the call to HTTP, and when the data comes in, just change it up on them. Say, hey, there's new data here. So we can set initial values as well. Yeah, there's nothing more frustrating to a user than when I go to a page and it's blank, right? And I'm trying to wait for that thing to load and inflate the, the form or the actual content that's there. It gives me the, the feeling like it's broken and I'm just going to move on to something else. So it's nice to have at least something there uh, to, to work with until that data is coming back. Absolutely. And I've talked for more than 30 seconds, haven't I? Uh, probably. <laughs> probably. So this should be refreshing. So if I hit another page now, I go to dashboards, look. It's very fast, but we are hitting XHR. And this is actually not hitting my machine here. It's going across the wire to an Azure function, which if we hover over here, you can see it's a API. So we should talk about what these Azure functions are. Yeah, let's move on. Get back to the slides, and I'll hand some of these reins off to you. All right. Is there a size limit on the cache? It's all in memory. We're not caching to local storage anything. This is totally in memory cache. That's a great question. So it really depends upon how much you want to cache. I mean, I wouldn't cache like the entire like census data. But you know, maybe a list of orders. Um, a great scenario for this might be inventory, actually. Because an inventory, unlike states, right? Yeah. States are forever, well, I hope. Yeah. But uh, inventory is something where you might be looking at inventory, and if Shane buys the product, the last one of the inventory, and I try to sell the other one to you, you kind of be nice to know before I take your money. Wouldn't you like to know that it's actually available? Yeah, product so category. Be... Product categories are a good one. Um, yep. You know, states, as you mentioned, are good. Those, you know, things that you put in drop-down lists are typically good. You know, stuff that's small amount of data. But yeah, you're restricted to what's uh, the memory. So that's yeah. A good by question. the way, and I think I hope you're not getting at this. I know you're not because I've talked to you already at this show. You're not getting at. Geez, can I cache my entire database inside the browser, and then disconnect from the network? Because we've never done that. Yeah. No, you never. can do so. But your yeah. entire database might be a little too much. Yeah. So how do we put together our app? Uh, obviously, we've talked about the need for data uh, when we're putting together these apps. Because without the data, there's not a whole lot we can do with an application. I mean, our da without data, our app is, our graphs are empty, right? So not yeah, we have a big blank screen and unhappy users. I don't know. It depends on what you're going for. All right. 
Uh, the next decision we have to make is how do we organize our data calls? John talked about uh, abstracting our service calls and then calling them from uh, our controller. So organizing the data calls are important, obviously, so we can reuse them throughout our application. And I think that makes sense. I think it's a pattern we're all used to seeing in regardless of the technology we're using. And some examples of that, right? Organizing, you already mentioned one, moving stuff off to a data service, right? Right. And just the mere fact that the component has no idea what's going on is great, actually, because the component shouldn't know or care, because you might have 100 components. It also allows us to put in that test JSON file right, and abstract that, that call out, and then we're ready to make onto an actual production yep. system like Azure Functions uh, without having to rewrite our whole application. Uh, the big question I think we get into a lot of times is, OK, I have a front end app. I've done my tests. I've hit my JSON. Let's write an API. Stop. How do we do that? Right? You know, Shane, years ago, this wasn't a problem. It was everything was one stack. <laughs> All of us have probably been at this point in our careers, right? If you've been around long enough, where you pretty much picked a stack, and that's what you li lived with. Web forms. Silverlight. Silverlight. <laughs> but today, we pick one of anything. So how do you choose from 20 different technologies? Right. And, and, and once I get that technology chosen, I have to build a server and a VM and create that and put that together and deploy that and manage that and put it in a container and make sure that scales and use DCOS and Mesos and... I forgot all about what I was building. Right? Exactly. So there's that. You need to know every technology, or do you? <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, and then, so the final question is, well, what if I could just write code, spin up the API, not worry about scaling it. I just want to make my calls, right? Um, that's what I would like to do. Right? I just want to write some code and make it happen. Who here would like to be able to do that? I mean, who would like to spin up an API? Yeah, I think right. most of you here, right? I just want to open a browser window, want to type some code, and hit save. And then that's my back end. And if it got hit by a thousand people, a thousand data calls, that it just scaled as I wanted it to scale. I think that's kind of nirvana. I wish there was us. a product that would help us with this. It's called Segway. It's actually called serverless. Serverless, right? <laughs> so it's called serverless. And a lot of technologies have it. So Azure has something called Azure Functions. Google Cloud has Google Cloud Functions. And then Amazon has Lambda. Lambda. Right. Uh, and this is a big wave that's hitting all the cloud providers out there. And there's other cloud providers that have them too. But the idea is these are really, they call it serverless, but it's not really without a server. It's just that you don't have to think about the server. So it's a way to create simple bits of code easily that give you APIs. Yeah. So we can talk about a little bit about the history before the cloud. Um, we had to... Uh, it was all you. It was your hardware, it was your VMs, your app servers, your on-prem stuff. Uh, it was in your co-location facilities. Uh, you had to build everything up. You had to manage all your routers. You had to do all the work yourself or a team within your company had to do all that stuff, right? Um, you know, what packages do I use on my servers? You know, how do I manage the stuff? How do I scale the things? Uh, there, so there was all these decisions that you guys had to make uh, before you actually got to sometimes just writing the code. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to worry about those things, right? And then we had infrastructure as a service. I think that's, uh, that was a big promise of uh, that's our next move, um, which was uh, where the cloud started coming in. We were making those decisions. We're like, great, we can start moving our servers to the cloud, have somebody else manage that, rent our, rent our infrastructure. Right? That was great. But you still have to think about what's in there when you rent the uh, IaaS. Well, it took away the hardware part. Yeah. Right? So now we're renting the house. Right? <laughs> so if the AC broke, we called somebody, and they fixed it, which was great. All right, so we still had to make a lot of these decisions. The decisions are going away for us. Um, patching, things like that. We didn't have to worry about those things. Now, it's, uh, the plat that was platform as a service, right? It's coming along, so that's great. We have a lot of decisions of stuff are going around. Now we're talking about how do I deploy my code. Uh, things are getting easier for us. Uh, I think now I'm kind of just writing my code. I'm checking it into Git, or I'm using TFS or VSTS, and now it's starting to just deploy for me. I think that's getting easier. But I'm still having to make decisions about how am I building my stuff, right? I'm still having to make the decisions of uh, how do I build my APIs. I'm doing Node. I'm using Express. I'm using Web API and still having to still package those things up and put it on an app service uh, in the cloud. Our decisions are still going away. Now there's serverless. Um, I, I saw a joke somewhere that uh, serverless is really not serverless. It's just somebody else's computer somewhere else. It's in the somebody closet. else's problem. 
Still somebody yeah. has this problem. <laughs> they still have to do it. There's still a server up in the cloud. It's not like Scott Guthrie decided, hey, you know, let's just imaginarily have these computers somewhere. There's data centers still, and there's, there's all these things, but we're, you can see we're progressively moving from you have hardware to platforms to what if I just need to call data? What if I just need a queue or a timer? That's where serverless comes into play. We have a lot of push buttons to make our little decisions go away. Yes. All right. So again, application architecture. Uh, we're getting to microservices. So the way I like to describe uh, serverless is it is microservices at the API call level. Right? So I'm scaling my endpoints. My product endpoint is now the only thing that has to worry about scaling. Right? So if my login uh, API uh, endpoint, I can scale that individually through my microservices. I'm running one function that handles my login, one function that handles my product call, another function that might handle my customer's call. And if that one endpoint is getting hammered, it's going to scale on its own, uh, which is a nice feature. Because before, we're having to learn how to scale our entire API. Uh, the entire application. The uh, other advantages here is we have through serverless, we've got webhooks uh, that we can do through um, you know, Git webhooks as things are being checked into our code. We can handle those. We're putting things into blob storage. A new image get, gets uh, handed off into SQL blob storage. We can do things with that particular image, make changes, queuing, or just use HTTP endpoints. We can respond to a, a request, a put, a post, a get, and do something with that action and respond to that just like we would a regular API. So what is serverless? It is, as we've spoken a couple of times now, it's the abstraction of servers. You do not have to worry about the underlying architecture. Yes, that still exists. It's not a room full of Raspberry Pis. Um, so let's play a game, Shane. Okay. You're telling me this is, I don't have to worry about it. I don't believe you because I'm pessimistic or skeptical here, okay? You're Joe. I'm, I'm me. <laughs> so. When I look at serverless, you tell me I don't need to do these things. Shane, this is great. You have one person hitting your app. OK, and now I have my phone, and I'm hitting the app, too. So now I have two devices hitting the same app. What happens when I go live, and I'm, you know, it's Black Friday, okay. <laughs> and I launch, and I need a million users to hit my app? Okay. What are you going to do? How do I make sure you're ready to scale? So the way that Azure Functions works is we do some telemetry based on the incoming call. We do some measurements. And then based on that measurements, we can kind of predetermine uh, how much traffic you can handle based on that. And then we will set up the underlying infrastructure and before scale it that becomes a problem. before it becomes a problem. So you don't wait till after it's already down. No. <laughs> we don't wait for the, the red light to go on before we do the scale. So we look to see and we can scale more servers, which to an app developer, I don't have to think about this, right? Right. And we're not scaling VMs you know, for your one call. We're not, we're not creating a VM for your Git call. Right? There is underlying architecture that handles the entire function application that contains your, your actual function calls. But that sounds expensive, too. So if I have to have this, whether it's Lambda or Azure Functions or Google Cloud, if I have to have these kind of functions up and running and be ready in case I do get pelted with a million calls, or it's just you know, the two here from my phone and my laptop, is uh, that running and costing me money all the time? Or how do they do that? You don't have a credit card? I do have one. Why? You want it? <laughs> so we only bill you on a consumption plan. So basically, we only bill you for the calls that uh, get executed on your functions. So anytime, if you're getting hammered on Black Friday, that's good for you. Hopefully, you're making money on those calls. Um, but if you are not getting active requests on those functions, then uh, you're not getting charged for that amount of time. All right, so if I can sum this up, because I'll make sure I'm hearing you right. With Serverless, because this is what got me more interested in it. With serverless for me, again, whether it's this product or it's from anyone else, the thing I like is that I was always worried with cloud, personally, that if I use it, I'm going to be costing too much money. I don't want to have to pay too much money to use something. Even my personal account, I don't want to be paying even 20 bucks a month or something if I don't use it. So with serverless, I'm only using what I pay for, which I like. And it'll scale when I need it to, and I don't have to think about the back end. And as a developer, that's the most important part to me is I don't have to worry about designing a whole backend structure. That's right. We've, number one, reduced our DevOps, mm -hmm. right? So we don't have to worry about the maintenance of our servers, um, the scaling of our servers. Uh, we focus only on writing actual code. And again, we reduce our time to market because, like I said before, I don't have to worry about building the entire API structure that I guess what we would call a monolithic application uh, to some degree and deploying that. So I can just write the code, get it in there, and go, right? 
But again, underlying, we do have some real code and some real uh, servers happening there, right? So that's kind of what Azure Functions is. You had some fun with those transitions, didn't you? <laughs> I can't take credit for it, but yeah, our functions team does a great job with our stuff there. So uh, a part of our uh, serverless services, we do have functions, which is what we're talking about today. You can connect uh, logic apps to that, which is basically, uh, if you've ever, anybody created a, a Microsoft Flow before? Flow app? So Flow is uh, actually logic apps. It's um, the same thing, and it uses um, functions. But these are all of the services that we have right now that you can connect your Azure Functions to. Um, so if you're using Azure Functions, um, these are all of the uh, other services that you can utilize along with that. So basically what uh, Functions does is it processes events. Um, and we can make great uh, cloud apps. I mean, we've got our little Star Wars API app that we wrote and an Angular front end that connects to it using HTTP. Uh, John's done some crafty things with some caching. And uh, made it all happen with the BAM, right? So let's, so let's take a look at what these functions look like, Shane. Because when I first heard about serverless again, and I, I explored Lambda, Google Cloud, and Azure Functions, what got me excited about all the platforms is that it's actually really easy to get going. So let's go up to the Azure portal, and I'll show you the running API that we've been hitting right now. So this is that Star Wars app. This is that app that's right here. And over here, this is the function app inside the portal. And we'll kind of walk through creating one too, but to show you what it looks like when you've got it. It's actually like a web app. It is a web app. And under the covers, I just have functions. So here's my allegiances function that I can have up inside the cloud. And it's got some code in it that's running my function. And then inside that function, I can do things like manage it. I can enable it or disable it on a function level. So we have a function app which contains multiple endpoints. The functions are endpoints. And then I can also monitor this. So the monitor shows who's hitting this and what the calls are. So it's going to look into the history of what's going on with my APIs. And it'll tell me who's called them, when they've called them. Uh, if there were error messages, it would show those. It also shows the duration. See one happened a few seconds ago right here. You can also hook up App Insights to this, which we yep. happen to have on this one as well, which allows you to analyze more details about it. You can also get alerts if it's down, if it's you know, errors out. Can, all the benefits of Application Insights you can get uh, right with an Azure Functions. So let's go create a new one real quick. We hit the plus sign. And over here, it's under Commute, or you could actually put in the, the Marketplace, right? So we can do Function App. And there's our function apps over here. We'll click on it. And we will create one. We'll give it a name. Let's call it Shane. I thought my name hey, was. Hey, it's actually available. That's cool. So we'll call this the Shane app. And we're going to put it inside of its, uh, an existing resource group that we have here. Uh, no, yep, did that have intersection work? You made that yesterday, Yeah, right? I made that yesterday. Yeah. All right, cool. Consumption plan means we only pay for what we use as we go through. I'm good with that. You good with that? Yeah, I'm good with that. And then we're going to create a new storage area called Shane01F for whatever reason. And you can turn on App Insights now or not. We'll, we'll kind of leave that off. So as that's building that, let's go look at the code for this function app. So if I go back into, and this is also up on GitHub, it's called Star Wars API. And you can look at this at uh, github.com slash johnpapa. I got font size 10,000. The way this app is designed, remember I had planets and allegiances and I had um, people. If we look inside planets, there's just two files. And those two files are the files that run my function. Index.js is my code. So here's the code for my function app. Remember I said I didn't have to set up ASP.NET or Node, Express, etc. With a function, you can choose what language you want to write them in. You want to write it in Python, go for it. You want to write it in ASP.NET with C Sharp, yeah, we have go C -sharp for it. For it. Yeah. You want to write it in JavaScript with Node, go for it. And a feature coming soon, which is actually an early preview right now, is writing it in TypeScript, which I'll take a quick look at in a minute too. And that's native TypeScript within the portal even. So up here, we didn't say, hey, use Express or all this other stuff. It's kind of handling it for us, right? Man, it looks a lot like Express though. So I just log out some stuff. I'm pulling in a variable on my call. This is for the, I forgot what folder I was in. It's for the planets. So I pull in, if there's an ID for the planet, I pull it in and I say, okay, go find the planet with that ID 
and return it into the response. If you didn't pass me an ID, just give them all the planets. Uh, that code's pretty easy. This is what kind of got me going when I first saw this. I'm like, wow, I can do this. I don't have to worry about the back end. I got a function up and running. I can add logging. I can hit Mongo or Cosmos, Cosmos DB. What's interesting to me is this looks a lot like the code, if not exactly like the code, if you are a Node application developer and you're writing Express or RESTify um, type of code, and you're, just respond, you're responding to an HTTP request that's coming in. You're getting the context, you're binding to the ID, you're going to get it from some data store, and you're just re doing a response dot return, basically. You're returning the data that's coming there, uh, just like I was writing an Express app, which is super beneficial to it's, me. Yeah, exactly. It's native, like it. it's native feeling. It feels like my language, right? It's what I like to do. And with each function in the folder, you also get this function JSON. This is kind of like the manifest for the function. The function JSON file helps Azure Functions know when you push this up into the cloud, how should it respond? So we've got authorization levels. You've got, what type is it? There's multiple types. We were using HTTP, but you can use timers and queues and other things as well. Yeah. What direction is this going? This is going in the methods. I'm only supporting get, but you can support all of them. You do put post delete patch. You give it a name. The name of the binding is request. This is important because that request there in line eight, that is the request up here on line one. So that's how it's getting the request information. And I need that if I want to inspect the request. And then notice the route. I'm using the same function to handle get me all the planets or get me one planet with that logic and the if then. So I'm using optional arguments here, saying it's an ID, it's an integer, and it's optional. And it's smart enough to know that either planets or planet slash 12 will both go to the same function. And you can also enable or disable them here. There's, and there's other properties. If you're looking for IntelliSense help with these two, by the way, you'll see IntelliSense come up here. Shane and I have authored a extension, which should be over here, because you just got the IntelliSense. Where'd it go, Shane? There it is. Yep, Azure Function Tools. It's available on the marketplace, and we're supporting uh, the, the schemas for functions, for proxies, and we just added something else to that, too. Uh, we did. We're adding stuff all the time. Yeah, constantly adding <laughs> things to it, yeah. But it's nice because now in the end, I like to write them in VS Code. Um, I love the portal, but I'd rather write code in my hard drive, <laughs> write it in my tool, write it where I want. And then when I'm done, I push this up to that GitHub repo, and then the Azure Functions has a git deploy connection, which looks at the repo. So if we go back to the portal, we can kind of see how it's going. And then here's our little app running off our nice little animations. I love those animations. And... I think this is our API, right? Uh, that's the front nope. end. That's the app. Yep. yep. So let's go to the API. Inside the API, we have to connect this to that GitHub repo. So where do I go in here, Shane? How do I know where that is? I'll let you drive it. Okay, let me drive. Okay. All right. So um, that, that's one of the biggest uh, features, too, for me, is that although writing code in the portal is nice to get started, um, I know for me, I just like to write code, check it in, move on, and know it's going to get deployed. So being able to do get, get deploy, or if you are working in VSTS, uh, you can check it in there and have those same types of hooks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to platform features, and we've got our deployment, I think it's under deployment options. And while it's it's loading, thinking about where those options our are. <laughs> you can see here we've got our history basically from our Git deployments here. John decided he was going to disable our stay alive. Um, that is not a John Travolta reference. Stay um, alive. And we've got our merge branch um, that we did on a couple things. We can see we've got a couple of commits here. So anytime we're doing a, a pull request, commits, that's going to sync that up there. And it's uh, this is the same as if you're using Azure App Service for web, web applications and doing your, your Git, uh, Git deployments through there. It's the same mechanism for hooking that up there. So Shane, show them also where, like when you get an Azure site, you get this like long URL. Yep. Let's we see. had a default URL for this um, function app, and we didn't want that. We wanted a custom domain. I bought a domain, uh, starwars-api.com, and I wanted to use that for my API. So inside of here, we were able to take the long uh, URL that they give us, and they have a feature called custom domains. So with custom domains, we can actually hook up a custom domain to our application. So the default one should be yeah. Yeah, right there. So let me show you the default one, obviously, is going to be under, I think it's an overview. Overview. Right? So we have our URL 
It's got you know, Papa dash Star Wars dash API, which is the name of our application, dot Azure Websites dot net. If we go over to our platform features, it's under networking. We've got custom domains. And we just add uh, our host names. There's some connectivity with your domain host that we would add an, an A record and have that pointed over to the IP address. And it's pretty much that simple. Now, you can't right? just like pick a domain. Like you can't just pick like Microsoft.com. You have to own the domain, obviously. And you can buy it through here, or go to GoDaddy, or wherever else you want to go. But right. you buy your domain, and you come here, you set up your record, and now we can point there. Shane, what about, um, this is great for running a function, but what about if I want to test the function? My stuff just works. Your stuff just works? Yeah. I write bugs. It keeps me in business, man. You would not believe some of the conversations we had about testing. All right. So uh, anybody familiar with Swagger? A couple? Yeah? Whoever? How many use Swagger? All right. What is Swagger? We don't know. We just wanted to ask you guys. That's so. what I bring to the presentation. <laughs> OK. All you right. Wish. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> um, so Swagger is also known as Open API Spec. And one of the preview features we have in Azure Functions is API definition. And I wish there was a way to make this larger. OK. So actually, I think we have an expand feature. All right. So we support, in Azure Functions, the ability to define all of your endpoints uh, using the Swagger Open API spec. So that's super helpful for building uh, testable harnesses using the Swagger UI. So in this uh, Open API spec, if you just start from scratch, so John in his uh, test API, I think, do you still have that one open here? Somewhere? No? I think there's a tab open with it. Tab? Right next to it. There we go. Not that one. All right, so what we did here is we built a quick test harness. This is the UI for our actual API, API allegiances. And it is a, a built-in, not a built-in, a test harness that we built using the Swagger UI that actually hits the Azure function. So if I went to hit Git and do the try it out and execute, this actually will hit the function itself, and if we went and looked at the logs that John, John showed on the monitoring, we would actually see this call and being able to uh, give us the true return. Here's our response body. This is actually coming from the Azure function, shows the response headers, uh, and such like that. Now, that's helpful for one test at a time. Um, anybody here using Postman, right? Pretty, uh, yeah, everybody love, love uses Postman. Postman. Woo. All right, so one of the things that you can do uh, with the Swagger file is actually import this into Postman. Do you have Postman on here? Did you just ask if I had Postman on the machine? You know, of course I have Postman. We on have the a machine. few machines. Sometimes we don't <laughs> have all the tools installed on the machines. So one of the things that we can do here is that I go to import and say import from link and go over to our browser again. Postman's actually a angular. A, uh, Sorry. It's a Chrome. It's yeah. a Chrome, it's so it doesn't like us sometimes. Uh, we can go to our API, look at our overview, go with the API spec. It gives us an API definition URL, which is this really long URL. And Ooh. we could copy that, but that's not human readable. Nope. Right? So one of the features that we have also in here is the ability to build proxies. So if we just finish that thought, though, if we copy that URL into Postman, it would suck it in. Right. But we don't want to write all that out. You no. want to show us an easier way to make your own URL. Correct. Because I can't, even though I could probably post that in Slack or text it to you, you might fat finger that. I don't know. You're pretty good at typing. So we have a custom domain called StarWarsAPI.com. Right. What if we want it to be StarWarsAPI.com slash docs? And that points to that URL. How do you make that magic happen? All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new proxy. And we have our docs here. So what I'm going to do is create uh, a proxy URL with our endpoint. That's that slash docs. You zoom in a little for you. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. And what it does is that at, if, uh, at our actual endpoint, which is proxy slash, uh, the slash docs there, if somebody goes to slash docs on our, our endpoint, we're going to redirect them to where the actual docs um, lives. And we have a different website, which hosts the test URL for us, mm -hmm. which is 
this. So you'll see the URL up top there is starwars-api.com slash docs. It really lives on a different app website, but through the proxy capability, we're able to build multiple proxies, like routing in ASP.NET or, or in Node. We can redirect the request coming in and send them to a new location. This is helpful for building a lot of stuff in the back end if we want to test some things out, but still build that nice front end for our production application. And uh, if we need to change stuff out in the back, we can without having to interrupt the front end experience. So we did. Shane and I like to write code on VS Code. Right. And we don't like to go to the portal to type all this in, too. Can you flip over to the code real quick, Shane, and show them where you can put the proxies in the code? Yeah. So you don't have to go through all this uh, menagerie. Uh, where in code? Yep. All right. So the, the actual folder structure for proxies. Yep, that's a swagger. So that was a proxies swagger one. <laughs> proxies. Is proxies.json. There's a proxy.json file. Oops, sorry. Go away dictionary. We know, how, we know what proxies means. It, <laughs> it wants to continually look up. It proxies. wants you to learn how to spell proxies. So oh, in our um, extension also for VS Code, we have the schema for this as well. So we get the nice IntelliSense. Uh, Proxies is defined here. We have a swagger one. What's our match condition, which is the actual route? So if anybody goes to slash swagger.json, we will send them to a backend URL, which is where uh, that actual code or uh, experience will live. So that's a little bit easier, right? You just go to swagger.json. It's going to, on this URL, it's going to automatically go to that long Azure Websites URL with that key that's like 80 characters long. So you don't have to type this stuff anywhere. The other thing that we did in here, too, is you'll notice that uh, in this particular route, you'll see that we've got uh, a parameter of star rest wrapped in the curly braces. Since in the uh, test harness for Swagger, uh, we've got probably got some additional parameters that might happen after docs. So if somebody goes to docs slash something, we want that continual proxy route to, to make sure it uh, passes the rest of the URL to that. Uh, that's how we would pass on additional, uh, additional pieces of that URL to go uh, to the to the. And we could do simple things too, right, Shane? Like we had planets and people and characters. But sometimes, let's say somebody's not a fan and we have something uh, that says characters, but they want to call it people. We could actually have the same route with two different names. We could create a proxy. So whether you type in characters or people, it goes to the same API function endpoint. Yeah. That's what proxies are for. They allow you to basically make up URLs that point you somewhere else. And it doesn't have to be on your own function. It could be on another server, even, which is kind of nice. Yeah. It's a great way to connect things together. And proxies are in preview right now with Azure Functions, uh, but they are working, as you can see right here today. And so is Swagger, isn't it, the open API? Yeah, Swagger is also in uh, preview. Uh, you can, again, uh, try them out. It works great. We've been using it here in this, as well as some other uh, test projects we're working on, too. And something that's kind of cool, I was playing with this this morning, Shane, and I wanted to show everybody how cool this is. We love our Postman. So in Postman, you can actually set up a runner. And the runner, if you create all your APIs in advance, you can select one of these. And you can see I've run a couple of them in the past hours, you select the runner you want, and you can tell, OK, run my Star Wars API, run it you know, 10 times with a delay of 1. And then you can start a test. And that's going to start running your API tests against your backend server. And if you ran App Insights with Azure, you're going to see the graph that's running on the uh, backend. You can see the calls going through and the different uh, times that they're taking. Any questions so far? about setting up Azure Functions? Who here likes TypeScript or C Sharp? Yeah, pretty much everybody in the room. One or the other in this particular place, right? right? Uh, one of the things I wanted to get into was using TypeScript. So this is all great, but TypeScript allows me to make less errors when I type my code, and it's just a little cleaner for me to get stuff done, and so is C Sharp. Both of those are supported. C Sharp more so. Yeah, C Sharp, we have uh, in Visual Studio 2017, there's an add-in for, for that. You can actually write uh, pre-compiled functions that you can just right-click and publish those right to uh, Azure Function through the IDE. And we'll come back to our little Shane function over here. It's not that little, is it? 
which we haven't added anything to. When we add a function, you'll notice here, we can choose a webhook API, that's what we chose. Notice we have C Sharp, JavaScript, F Sharp, or you have Python or other actions that you want to take. So we can choose one of these other ones and create our own function. I'll choose JavaScript again just to show that works. And here's a default function that it creates for you. And then once you save that, you can run it. We'll save it right here. There's actually a little test harness there what you can run, and this one just returns the word Azure, but you could hit this off of Postman or anywhere else you want. But I mean, you see seconds is all it takes to get a function up and running, which is really wicked cool. But let's get back to TypeScript, because you saw there was no TypeScript object to choose from. Yeah. So we created a second branch in our GitHub repo. And that second branch, if you click down here, uh, I'm in the wrong repo, let's go to the API. So that's the front end, this is the API. And in this one, there's a TS branch. So if you happen to look at that, you'll see the TypeScript stuff. And I wanna put up a warning here, there be dragons ahead. TypeScript is preview preview. It's really early, and so much that the team and Chris Anderson and Don and all of them at the back of the Azure Functions team haven't really announced it officially yet. Uh, but I'm kinda bleeding edge, and I like to look at stuff. Yeah, bleeding, bleeding edge for sure. And it does work. So I wanna show you kinda how this works. We come back to our API, Let's switch over. We'll do a git checkout of TS. And it pulled it over. And now I have the same setup for functions. The cool thing is my function JSON stuff's all exactly the same. The big difference now is where's my TypeScript? So with TypeScript, one of the advantages is I share different files. Like I have a filter function that I use every time I call one of the APIs, say, give me all the planets with this ID or give me the people with that ID. I want to share that filter function. So what we have in here is we have an API folder with a services, and I've got a planet service. You can see I'm hard coding the data there. I've got my people service. I've got my films. I've also got filters. Now here's a filter function I'm using to get a match. You give me the list and the ID, and I'll give you back the one that I find, or nothing if I didn't find anything. I want to share that around. So TypeScript allows me to take all my code. I've got models. I have my classes here. You can imagine where C-sharp would do this as well. So I've got my classes for my models. I've got my films that are creating those. I'm returning back a function called get films. We could also do it to hit a database if we wanted to. And then here's our actual logic. So let's look at the films. In the films logic, I import the get films. I set up my body, my status, my response. And it's pretty much the same logic as you saw in the JavaScript, but just a little bit more typing and IntelliSense and tooling help that lets me work with this. Now, is there, is there a difference with TypeScript when you're going to push this up? Do I have to worry about having TSC? Do I have to worry about doing compilation? Do I have to do any of that before I push this up to the Azure function? Yeah, it's a great backend? question. You do have to compile your TypeScript, or transpile as we like to say it, from TypeScript to JavaScript before you push it up. Uh, so you want to transpile that and then let the Azure functions deal with it. Or Azure functions can read TypeScript right now. So you don't have to do your TSC if you want to run TypeScript in the browser. You literally can open it up, and this is not a feature that is known in here right now today, but all you have to do is go to that API, like the Shane API. If I come over here, you notice the view files. I could take that index.js, I could delete that file, or rename it to index.ts, and just start writing TypeScript, and it would work. Again, this is preview, preview, preview stuff that we're showing. But it's really cool. So it actually lets you skip the step of compiling on your home computer or your work computer and pushing it up if you don't want to. Although you could still do TSC locally right. if you so choose. And I kind of like that. To me, I like that because then I can just write my code, get it running. Uh, but when I'm done, all said and done, there'll be features in here that'll help us compile and get it ready so it's not compiling on the fly. Right now it's compiling on the fly. If I write TypeScript in the portal, because it got, has to get hit, looks at the TypeScript, compiles it to JavaScript, then it runs. I don't want every user to wait for that, so I'm going to pre-compile TypeScript to JavaScript and let it do that. And there's a pre-compile for C-sharp, isn't there? Yeah, there is a, there's a bit of it. If you're doing the, the experience in the portal, just, just, just like, uh, like you're talking about with TypeScript, there is a small uh, comp compilation step that happens. Uh, or if you're doing it in Visual Studio 2017, we can do that pre-compile function where we're compiling it, we're creating an assembly, you define an endpoint, so you can have multiple functions in your C-sharp code. Um, go ahead and compile that, 
publish that to Azure, and then you're not paying that compilation hit um, prior to um, any application hitting that function. Awesome. So kind of just wrapping things up, we showed a lot of little things put together. What's nice about this is whether you're building Angular, React, iOS, Swift, Xamarin, whatever your front end happens to be, there's cool ways that you can build APIs and backends really quickly, and they scale really well, which is, almost doesn't go together a lot of times. Yeah. Whenever you can build something fast, someone's like, yeah, but is it real world? So with functions, that kind of takes both these things and puts them together for us. I like your bam. You like that? <laughs> Boom. Need sound yeah. effects. And if you want to learn how to build a quick Angular app, uh, there's a course I put up on Pluralsight, show you how to build Angular apps super fast. You can use those as your front end harness, or you can use Postman. Or you can use Postman to Postman's test. Postman's easy to do. Yeah. We looked at how we can test APIs, Swagger, which is the new name is what? Open API spec. Open API spec. Yep. And uh, to wrap up, I just want to thank you all for coming, and I hope you had a great week. If you have questions, we'll be happy to stick around. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.